Video is ready. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Open Data Science Syrup Workshop here in Wageningen. And also for those of you that are joining virtually, uh, my assistant is going to let in the uh, remaining people, but uh, for those of you joining virtually, for those of you here in the, in the Wachen International Conference, welcome, uh, good morning, and um, enjoy, please uh, enjoy the program, enjoy the workshop, uh, interact with people, ask questions, feel free to ask questions. Um, this uh, first session, the first 20 minutes, I would just like to address some uh, open uh, open issues and mention uh, something about our projects uh, and also announce some things in the workshop. Uh, so it's a five day event. Uh, some of you followed the uh, first two days, which were uh, training sessions. We now switch to the science, uh, technology and the business uh, sessions, uh, which is uh, basically uh, uh, talks, oral talks and then some discussion panels. But uh, we really work hard to make a interesting program. And uh, we really also work hard to get uh, cutting edge uh, uh, developers and uh, keynote speakers. So uh, basically leaders in the field. So very happy with the, with the program of the workshop. Um, so as I said, it's uh, 20, 12 uh, keynote speakers. Uh, we looked uh, uh, to, especially we looked at the OSGEO and we look at the uh, geo secretariat and uh, communities, uh, which also support the uh, building of open source software and uh, uh, open data. Uh, we had uh, 150 registered participants, um, uh, uh, from which most of uh, most of participants actually uh, registered for the virtual events. Um, we had unfortunately lots of cancellations for the physical event. This is the new reality. We don't we don't stress out too much about it. It's a special times. Uh, nevertheless, it's really great to see people in person, even on a distance, but it's great to see people in person. And, and I hope uh, uh, many of you are probably uh, vaccinated as us, fully vaccinated, and I hope uh, slowly the pandemic will uh, be behind us. Um, but we, of course, prepared and we followed the, all the measures uh, uh, asked, uh, required by the Wachen International Conference Center. Um, we plan to have almost 48 hours of uh, recorded sessions. Uh, they will be published on the, this uh, um, European uh, uh, system uh, hosted by TIB. Um, so that's the European system where each video gets a DOI. Uh, so unlike uh, uh, YouTube and, uh, and uh, other services, which are really uh, proprietary, and where you, anytime you click on it, you get some commercials that you're not really interested in. Uh, unlike this, uh, we will uh, actually publish the videos in an uh, open domain and each video will get a DOI, so it get, uh, kept, uh, gets uh, kept uh, uh, for a long time. Uh, also, we have uh, two launches this week. We plan, of course, the launches carefully. Uh, one of the launches is, um, is a software called EU Map, uh, and so we're very excited to have that software now ready with all the documentation. Um, and also we have the Open Data Science Europe Viewer. Uh, also it's uh, almost complete and uh, there will be a, a, a update of that system. Uh, we will give a demos uh, during the, the conference. Uh, and also on Friday, we will give you a full demo with a 3D uh, viewer of the Open Data Science Europe Viewer um, and all the new functionality you'll be able to uh, use it and explore. Uh, we're quite proud of that system. That's a kind of central system that we built. Um, I should mention also we are uh, funded, we are project funded by the uh, European Union uh, with uh, 1.4 million uh, from which uh, uh, to, uh, on top of it, we also put down 25%. Um, and uh, we are uh, five institutions. Um, the agency that uh, is uh, uh, funding us uh, used to be called INEA. Uh, in the meantime, they changed the name, so don't get confused. Now it's called European Health and Digital Executive Agency, or HADEA, uh, but they are directly under the European Commission, basically. 
Um, this is who we are, the project. Uh, so Open Geo Hub is a technical lead on the project together with the uh, CTU Prague. Um, we are the, uh, we administer and lead the project, but we also have Mundialis, Terra Signa, uh, Gilab and Multi One. They are also contributors to the system to different components. Uh, this is a picture just before the pandemic. Uh, it was February uh, 2020, and uh, you see it was a cold day. We went on this in um, on top of the CTU. Uh, there is a measurement station, I think, meteorological station. So we went there. It wasn't the most beautiful day, um, but uh, it was the uh, last time we were actually uh, hanging together and uh, doing something in person. So it's nice to be back to see people again. Um, unfortunately, there's some sad news. We, one of our main, uh, main uh, uh, people on the uh, project, uh, Marcus Nettele, he had uh, health issues and uh, uh, just happened a few weeks ago, uh, serious health issues. And we feel very sorry for him and we wish him a uh, uh, recovery and we wish him that he comes back. He's one of the key people in the open source. He's one of the main contributors to the GRASS and uh, also to this project. And so we, it happens, uh, uh, he had this health issue in, in front of the uh, project and in front of also you, I think, and uh, the whole uh, open source community. We wish him the, a good recovery and that he come back, back to us. Um, this is the photos, there are photos from recent days. We had two days now uh, here, we were doing training and we were uh, video recording all the trainings in a, a high definition. Um, and uh, these videos are available on YouTube. Um, and so you can uh, watch them already. Uh, it's a really hands-on training. We, uh, we had uh, sessions in Python, in R, uh, GraphGS. Then we had sessions in WebGS. So that's really hands-on. So people screen share and uh, they code in front of you. So, so you can see that we are really people making the code. We don't have to uh, hire other people to make code for us. We are the the technical developers. And so I really enjoyed the training sessions, but it was, you know, most of people were online. I would say about uh, two thirds, uh, most of lectures, two thirds of people were online. Only one third was there, but still it's, it was again, nice to be back to school and uh, interacting with students. Uh, as I said, these videos are now already available. You can see uh, some of the videos that are really taking off. We have already a few hundred views, up to 400 views. So some, some of the videos are really taking off. There's a high interest. Uh, so we're very happy about that. And uh, you know, our motto, the Open Geo Hub, we are known for Profit uh, Research Foundation. Our motto is connect, create, share, repeat. Um, it's a, it's a something that I came up with uh, very quickly. Uh, it was very natural to put these four words. Um, and, um, and now people, yeah, if you just, uh, you don't have to say a long text, you know, who are you open to have? We are the connect, create, share, repeat. That's who we are. Um, and that's what we do, as I said. Uh, one more time, the videos uh, will be published. Uh, also these videos, the lectures, they will be published on the uh, TIB, um, uh, so that's an institute in Germany that um, um, kindly uh, hosts the uh, scientific material. We are a registered publisher with them. And so we are very happy that we can move, move away also a bit from these uh, big corporations and uh, uh, put also some materials in uh, um, non-commercial uh, video portals. Um, I was following the visitors in the last days. Um, so we had a... Uh, we had quite some international visitors. It's, this is a European project, but uh, I will tell you honestly, I, I, uh, I think uh, even if you want to make something for European citizen, you should uh, look around and uh, we should also think about connecting with other uh, countries in the world and the continents. And I'm super happy to see lots of Canadians, uh, lots of um, uh, people from US, uh, from Brazil, uh, following uh, following some of the lectures and uh, they also registered to participate in the uh, in the training and also they will follow the lectures uh, though it's a time difference so they will probably follow the ones in the afternoon uh, we also super happy uh, one of the trainers is uh, from Argentina um, and uh, she was uh, she was giving uh, yesterday some uh, she was helping yesterday but she will be giving also a talk uh, I think uh, today. Uh, so she's connecting from Argentina to give a talk. And also we have Gilberto Camara, 
uh, as far as I know, he's still in uh, Brazil, and so he will be also giving a talk directly from Sao Paulo. Uh, so we are quite international, uh, and um, and so uh, we go beyond uh, beyond the European Union. Also, many people ask us when they submitted papers. They say, "Well, I'm." Uh, there was a colleague from Morocco. He says, "Hey, I work on uh, Morocco uh, data. Uh, can I submit to your conference?" I said, "Of course. It's uh, it's not a problem. This is called uh, Open Data Science Europe." Uh, but um, we are interested, of course, to have talks from uh, anywhere in the world. Um, we are, uh, every time we give uh, uh, some, uh, there is a talk, a training session. Uh, our um, uh, media office, uh, led by uh, Valentina Del Conte, um, media office makes sure that everything is uh, announced. So we do everything tidy. So everything is announced correctly. Uh, and uh, so anybody following our channels don't, it's, so we try to be, uh, what I'm trying to say, we try to be as least bureaucratic as possible. So we make sure that on all our channels, everybody knows where the things are. So they're very easy to find and follow. Um, what we're really specially proud of is this uh, uh, data portal we made and we call it the Open Environmental Data Cube for Europe. Um, and I think you maybe interacted a bit with it. Uh, just very quickly, um, I will give a demo. There will be more demos, of course, uh, later on. So we are somewhere here. Um, and so I can zoom in maybe to close to Wageningen. Um, and so what you see here, this is this was the one of the first products we made was the land cover. And we mapped the land cover using ensemble machine learning. We mapped the changes of land cover for whole of Europe now at 30 meter resolution, fully automated, fully scalable. Uh, so using uh, fully parallel solutions and using the uh, cutting edge uh, machine learning we could find in Python and R. Uh, and as you see in this, uh, on this uh, map, I can also turn on, I can turn on the uh, points. So we can see there's a lot of points used for training. So this is, a, I think, uh, what we call open data science. Uh, so open data science means that you can go back and you can track you can track actual points and models that are used for training, and you can track the code that was used to create the map. So you, you are eventually you come to the level that you can reproduce what we made. So let's say something happens to this project, then the community can take over. Uh, so this is what we call open uh, open science project. So uh, open science for me, uh, most important thing in open science is that you do reproducible research so that you document all the steps um, to the level of potentially full reproducibility. And then the second thing that you use open data licenses. And so that's, uh, that's, what, we, uh, uh, that's what we try to do here. Uh, so going back to the slides. Um, uh, so we have this uh, uh, as a central method we use in the the project, it's a spatial temporal machine learning. It's a new paradigm. Um, basically, you take a field like a land cover. Um, and what you do is uh, you fit a one model to represent land cover of Europe. So that's uh, in most simple terms to a non-expert explaining what is a spatial temporal machine learning. So one model to rule it all. Um, and so once you get that model, it's a large model. And it takes, if you can, if you can believe me, it takes about uh, three days to feed the model. So it's a really heavy computing. Um, but once you get that model, and if it's good, then you can predict anywhere in the space-time cube. Uh, you can produce this time series of predictions, and that's the one I was showing you. And you also can map for uncertainty. And also we can now uh, go and predict for 2022. We can also predict land cover. We don't need any more training points. That's one of the big advantages of using the uh, space-time land cover. Uh, officially now the open the EU map uh, library so open source library in Python officially now it's published I declare it officially published I would like to congratulate the team um, it's led by the uh, our Leandro Parente but also by the with contributions from the uh, CTU uh, Prague especially um, uh, Martin Landa and colleagues so I would like to congratulate you this package is now fully documented. Uh, it can be installed, it can be used. So this is uh, officially now we release it. Um, the special theme of the uh, this workshop is the special temporal modeling of European landscapes and climate. So we uh, we took a, 
a special care to um, um, uh, the the, uh, the people that we invited for the workshop that they are um, of course connected to the field. So we're very happy we have a, a quite some um, a talks in the uh, area of climate climate modeling climate research. So we are very happy to have a couple of talks and please uh, uh, keep your eyes on these talks on especially on Friday. So there will be some excellent talks. We also have some talks about global data sets and we will show you, we'll go beyond Europe. Uh, so, um, but the uh, special team will stay the uh, special temporal modeling of European landscapes and climate. Um, then we have a super interesting discussion on Friday, which will be led by uh, our colleagues from Terra Signa, uh, Kudrina and Vasile. Uh, the discussion session is on how to secure sustainability of open data project um, so how, how do we, if you make a system, we are really grateful to the European Union and European Commission for funding us, but how do we make sure that uh, um, unlike, uh, unfortunately, many EU projects, uh, how do we make sure that it stays vital, that it stays uh, in use and that uh, people uh, uh, get benefit beyond this project. So that's something we will discuss and please join that uh, panel discussion. Uh, then also on Friday, uh, end of the workshop, we will do a award ceremony and we will officially have a demo of the new open uh, data science Europe Pure. So there's a new version coming. It has the world wind. Uh, so it's fully 3D. Uh, it, it will have also the forest uh, species distribution predictions, actual and potential. So a couple of new layers coming up, couple of new functionalities. So that's a also a big launch, big thing for us. Um, and with uh, this thing, I would just like to use the last few minutes uh, just to uh, thank, um, because we build up on the uh, work of other people. We didn't start from scratch. Uh, this is uh, open source, it's a community movement. Uh, so we build up on the work of other people. We use a lot the uh, uh, GDAL, of course, and uh, Python and R, and um, uh, we use GraphGS and other uh, software inside the OSGO, especially QGIS. We also use OpenStreetMap data. So I should mention all these organizations and really thank them uh, because we build up, we stand on the shoulders, on their shoulders. Uh, we also, uh, we wouldn't be able to do like 80% of our work if um, uh, uh, European Commission and European Space Agency didn't decide uh, to put the uh, data, the satellite data in open domain and also the, the US uh, federal agencies, uh, they decided to put the Landsat uh, data in open domain. And if, if that wasn't the case, we wouldn't have been able to do this work. So uh, we are very happy that this data was made available to us so we could do build up on top. Um, and also I would like to announce before we switch to next speaker, there is a, another workshop coming um, in uh, Prague uh, next June, the date's already set. Um, so it will, it's a really beautiful spot to go, of course, maybe uh, more attractive than Wageningen, and of course, but uh, of course, it's a beautiful spot to go. And we already had the workshop there, so I guarantee you the excellent host, the CTU. Uh, and they have also uh, professional uh, rooms for the, uh, for the conference and workshops. So we're really looking forward to coming to Prague. And one more time, remember the dates 13th to 17th of June. So the date's already set, and uh, we're hoping that it could be that these uh, rooms are going to be more filled than maybe this room. Uh, so we're hoping that it's going to be uh, hopefully uh, more people uh, in person than uh, virtually. But we are ready, it's going to be again a hybrid event. We are ready uh, to go also fully uh, online if it's required. Uh, it will be again five day event and it will be, uh, um, it will be an event that uh, uh, with the discussions and, uh, and then eventually we will uh, close the uh, close the uh, workshop, and uh, at, uh, and then in August I think it's the end of the project. So it's also a nice way to finish. Uh, there will be deadlines uh, um, announced. Uh, I think the first deadline you should memorize is the first of uh, March. Is the abstract submission deadline, and then the other deadlines will be announced on the website. Uh, and for contacts, you can contact uh, Eva and Martin. They will talk one more time before we close this workshop. They will talk about this event uh, that's going to come. And with this thing, I would just like to thank one more time everyone for uh, coming to conference or registering. Uh, I would also like to thank my staff uh, for hard work, uh, which will continue uh, next days. 
so thank you all and uh, enjoy the workshop. Enjoy and um, ask questions. We have a microphone um, and join the discussions. Um, so feel feel uh, engaged, feel uh, uh, invited to participate. Uh, so now we in the program we change to the our uh, online speaker um, and we are very happy to have two uh, first speakers uh, employees of the European Commission and they will talk directly about the the big picture the uh, connecting Europe facility and also about the so the European policies and uh, European regulations the first speaker I would like to announce is Daniela Rizzi uh, so please uh, Daniela uh, you can take over and you can do the screen sharing. Thank you very much. So uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be, to be here and to, to say a few words on uh, uh, the European policy uh, on data. Uh, I'm now starting to share my screen, uh, putting something uh, uh, as big as possible. And I hope you can see it. Voilà. Yes, we see. Okay, great. So, uh, first of all, the, the framework within which we, 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 we operate in the Commission, uh, among other things, of course, last year, you may remember in uh, February 2020, the Commission adopted a communication uh, on a European strategy for data, which is actually the sort of Bible that we are following now uh, to uh, implement uh, uh, supporting activities and to adopt a certain number of legal acts. So we will start first from, from the legal part of, uh, of these uh, activities. Uh, so the, the, the communication included a certain number of legal acts to be adopted in, in the coming uh, uh, years. Um, and uh, they, you, you can see them here. Uh, first of all, the Data Governance Act, which I will uh, uh, describe a bit more later. This was already adopted as a commission proposal, of course, in November 2020. It is now in, uh, in the, of course, legal co-decision process, so in the hands of the Parliament and the Council. And uh, we hope to have its uh, final adoption uh, next year. Uh, but the text is already there, at least the proposal that the Commission has put on the table, and it contains, I think, a lot of uh, important uh, uh, proposals to, uh, to regulate or to make the, the data market uh, more efficient. Then there has been the adoption uh, of the uh, Digital Market Act. Uh, this, I, I, I won't say much on this. This was this is a, a legal act which was uh, uh, due since a long time. Uh, and uh, it's more uh, addressing uh, uh, how to regulate, for example, the big uh, companies which uh, work on, 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 the, on the data market and to regulate a bit uh, their power or try to, to make it more fair. Uh, something uh, uh, very close to the uh, open data uh, interest, uh, an implementing act uh, coming from the open data directive. This I will, I will spend some time later. And finally, uh, uh, a data act, so something which is uh, in a way complementing the data governance act and uh, which is on which we are currently working on. There has been recently a, a public consultation which closed a few days ago. And we are now taking into account the, uh, the feedback uh, from uh, stakeholders and citizens. And we count to put uh, uh, again uh, a, a proposal uh, on the table of the uh, co-legislators uh, co uh, co uh, by the end of the year. Uh, so a few more words on, on two of these initiatives uh, from the legal point of view, the Data Governance Act. So the text is out there as a proposal. It is uh, consists of uh, basically five chapters. The first one is addressing uh, how uh, public administrations uh, could uh, uh, make available data which are not under the Open Data Directive, so which uh, uh, should not be made available uh, as open data because there are some security or confidential issues, but nevertheless, uh, uh, public administration would like to make them available to a more limited uh, set of users. And, and this is a chapter which tries to, 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 to define some generic rules for this in order to have a, a, a sort of homogeneous approach to this, uh, uh, to this problem uh, at the European level. 
Then there are a few, uh, a few articles regarding uh, uh, how data intermediaries, so those who act between the data uh, owners and the data reusers, could act again in order to have a certain uh, easier uh, functioning of, of the data market. Um, some proposals, some articles concern a framework for data altruism. So data that uh, private uh, companies in particular could make avail made available for free, uh, but for uh, the benefit of the society. Yeah? So data which normally should not be reused for commercial uh, purposes, but for, could, for example, be used for research or for uh, improving uh, applications uh, addressing citizens. And then um, final, uh, uh, final component is uh, the proposal to set up a so-called European Data Innovation Board. So a high level board composed by member states and uh, uh, European stakeholders to uh, in a way have a sort of supervision of the activities that we want to implement uh, to make uh, the data market uh, uh, better. And uh, there will also be an influence on what I will say later on, on the activities uh, uh, proposed by the Digital Europe program. And there is also a final chapter on uh, how to build a trust when it comes to international situations, so data exchanges with third countries. Um, something very concrete on which we are working since a long time, and we hope to have it adopted uh, by the end of the year. Uh, well, you know, uh, certainly all the Open Data Directive, which was adopted in 2019, and I put it here now because uh, um, the, uh, the Open Data Directive uh, had uh, uh, two years to be transposed into national legislation. So this uh, deadline expired in July uh, this year. It was 20 days after the, that adoption, 20 June 2019. So we are now uh, receiving the transposition in national uh, legislation from uh, all the 27 member states. We are making an assessment and then uh, we will have some, uh, most probably, some, some reactions or some feedback to, 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 to give to member states. Uh, but mostly uh, we find that the, the transposition, as far as we can say now, has been well received and well made. So uh, this means that uh, from now on, uh, the directive uh, is a uh, fully enforced in a way, yeah? because for a directive, what counts is the transposition into national legislation. Uh, but the, the Open Data Directive also contained something that we, you certainly know, the uh, attribution to the Commission to adopt uh, an implementing act uh, to define a certain number of very specific data sets, which should be made available with uh, uh, under condition, which are even more interesting than those applicable to, in general, to the Open Data Directive. So in particular, there are some additional obligations, uh, having this data set made available completely for free, because the Open Data Directive still have a few exceptions where some marginal costs should still be charged, but this data set should be made available fully free. They should be machine readable format, which means uh, not only PDF, but also uh, formats which can be reused uh, easily and made available also, this is particularly important, via APIs. That is that this should facilitate or allow the reuse of this data directly uh, through machine-to-machine -machine, uh, uh, application and not only downloading through a sort of a human uh, interface on a website, which is still, of course, very important, but this should improve uh, uh, further the possibility to reuse this data. So this is something on which we are uh, working on. Uh, we are uh, bound for the time being to the six uh, uh, um, domains that you can see there, uh, which are still quite wide, but there are a few of them which are not yet uh, covered. And we, we can also probably shortly start to think how to extend this uh, uh, list of uh, uh, priority domains. Now, uh, moving to something which uh, is more on how uh, the data market can be improved and uh, users can uh, have an easy access to data and to open data um, from the practical point of view, not only the legislative one. Uh, first of all, something which is already existing there because of course we have not started to work on open data or on data since last exactly. year. Uh, geoportals, uh, portals, and uh, also a geoportal uh, exists in some time. Uh, we have the geoportal, which is stemming from the uh, Inspire Directive, out there since some time. 
And uh, uh, the European Data Portal, which uh, since a few months is called data.europa.eu, you can see it on, on the right side of the, uh, of the screen. Uh, this is something that we have uh, recently uh, upgraded, merging uh, data coming from uh, member states and some other European countries with data coming from the European institutional body. So now this, uh, there is a single entry where you can find uh, all, basically all open data made available by uh, national open data portals and some regional ones, as well as uh, data coming from the European Commission, uh, Parliament, Council and many agencies. Uh, today or yesterday, there were more than uh, uh, 1,200,000 data sets available, uh, all with a, a single metadata model, uh, which allows to, to, to search uh, uh, in, a, in an easy way through all countries and, and the European institutions, and uh, um, as well as uh, uh, fields which are should tell you, for example, which kind of reuse you are allowed to, to do and so on. And there are, it's a portal, but uh, I think it's something which, which has also developed quite a lot in the, in the, in the past. And uh, I invite you to, to give a look to, to these last uh, versions. Uh, there is also something which is a bit less known, but it's quite in, interesting. And I also put it here because it will be further developed in, uh, in the future. It's what we call support system for data sharing. It's again a website. Here you find the mostly um, information and support on how to, 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 to share data, uh, not only open data, but also data coming from the, from the uh, private sector. Uh, you can see there in, in, in that uh, orange menu, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of points that you can find there. It's already quite, uh, quite, uh, quite uh, filled in with, uh, with uh, documentation. Uh, so yeah, the, you, you find a lot of uh, documents or reports which uh, explain you, for example, uh, how to implement a good API, uh, how to uh, um, uh, make, APIs, uh, make APIs safe, uh, take into account cyber security uh, reasons or necessities, uh, and so on. And there is also uh, and there is, uh, this is more on the, on the technical aspect, there is also something concerning legal aspects. Eh? So, for example, again, I think in the two APIs, how to set up uh, with a sort of, uh, let's say, semi-automatic way, a sort of license which uh, uh, can accompany an APIs to, 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 to specify, uh, legally speaking, what uh, is allowed to do with those data and what is not. Uh, now I move to the future. <laughs> Uh, the, in a way, I think, uh, long awaited the Digital Europe program, which is uh, in, in the pipeline since some time. Uh, it is finally on its really last, uh, last mile. Uh, we, we think uh, it should be adopted uh, by the end of this month or beginning of October, after a certain number of steps, including uh, public consultations, of course. Um, it is a program which basically uh, tries to put together uh, even if it is not the only program, of course, supporting digital, but uh, uh, it is the, the combination of programs which in the past were a bit, uh, 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 let's say, uh, distributed. Uh, for example, the, uh, what you know very well, the, the um, Connecting Rural Facility Program, uh, the ISA Square, and so on. Now uh, we, we try to put most of these activities in, in, in a single package, which is quite complex still. Uh, and uh, it, it is uh, arranging, uh, arranged around uh, uh, basically five components hmm, that you can see there in yellow. Um, I will drill down a bit more. I, of course, I, I, I have no time, no, no, not all the competencies necessary to develop uh, anything on cybersecurity, on uh, IEPC, but uh, I will develop a bit more on what we are going to do with data. So this is already uh, a snapshot a bit more detailed, even if it looks complicated, but you, you can give it uh, a look later uh, on uh, uh, a specific one of the five chapters of the Digital Euro Program, which is the one uh, mostly uh, addressing data. And you can already see some components uh, which are quite crucial uh, for us. Uh, first of all, those domains that you can see there, uh, manufacturing, green deal, mobility, etc. These are the uh, first priority domains which have been already uh, defined in the uh, data strategy communication. 
around which uh, we would like to uh, build the so-called data spaces. I, I will, I will uh, describe a bit more what we mean with data spaces. So those are the domains that we start to address, at least in, uh, in the first two years of the work program. And these are complemented, or you have the horizontal components. Huh? Uh, so you have uh, the uh, digital twins, so uh, supporting ways of uh, creating sort of uh, uh, clones, uh, uh, digital clones of, of, of some parts of the reality. Uh, you have the high value data sets, which are sort of horizontal contribution to this uh, uh, domain related data spaces. Uh, the testing uh, facilities, which uh, should create a, a platform where you can test uh, uh, and you can experiment uh, with data. And there is a component, so this is the component mostly on data, and on the lower part of the, uh, of the screen, you can see the component which is more supporting infrastructure. So, of course, uh, we have a component which is basically the content, the data, the software, the artificial intelligence uh, component, but we also need something to have all this work, and the, this component is in the lower part. So, there is also, in the Digital Euro program, uh, uh, a huge support uh, to uh, uh, finan for financing the setting up of a cloud, a European cloud infrastructure and uh, high performance computing. So all this should create a sort of uh, global uh, framework where at the same time we have the computing capability, uh, the cloud where you can store uh, uh, securely data uh, in Europe and uh, the content which is data. What are the European data spaces? It's basically uh, a virtual environment. And not, it's not uh, uh, databases or places where data are stored. It is also, of course, storage capabilities, but it is a, all the condition which uh, should allow for a specific domain uh, to exchange data easily. So having, for example, rules or recommendation for uh, technical and uh, legal standards to, to make this data available, um, a platform where this data could be exchanged, and so on. Um, we started thinking that uh, uh, we need first to think in terms of domain. We cannot think that uh, from day zero we can have a, a unique data space at the European level where any kind of data from any domain can be exchanged easily. It would be uh, ideal, but of course uh, uh, impossible in the reality. So we thought that to gradually go to uh, maybe one day uh, where we have just one single market where any kind of data can be exchanged, we start with creating uh, or supporting uh, specific domain uh, data uh, spaces. And then little by little, we will go as it, we, 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 well, in Europe, it took decades to, to get to a functioning uh, market for goods. Uh, the idea, uh, final uh, scope is to have uh, one single European data space for the data space. But for the time being, we start with domain related ones. Uh, these are some key characteristics of the of, of data space. So it must be uh, an infrastructure, of course, but a data governance mechanism, you know, how to this data can be exchanged, both from the legal but and uh, non-legal, let's say, uh, from the soft uh, law or recommendations, uh, uh, allowing the data holders to stay in control of the data that they made available for free or under payment, uh, uh, having clarity uh, from the uh, reuser side on what they can do and what they are not allowed to do with those data, and uh, uh, having as much as possible the participation of all stakeholders concerned, both from the reuse and from the uh, uh, production uh, data production side. But so, as I, I, I said uh, now several times that we are uh, starting uh, defining uh, uh, domain related data spaces, we also think that from the very beginning we need to have a sort of horizontal layer where all these data spaces, even if they concentrate and they start working on their domain, are not starting to diverge too much. So uh, something which tries to keep a sort of horizontal level where uh, what can already be shared uh, uh, across domain uh, is already implemented. And this is the role of something which will be quite uh, crucial and critical, not easy, but uh, uh, 
we have we think a quite a quite an important role the support center for data spaces uh, supported by the digital euro program it is in a way the evolution of what i showed before which already exists which is the so part of center for data sharing, which is for the time being basically just providing some 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 resources. This will be go much beyond, uh, and we have also a certain role in uh, not in defining, but in in uh, in uh, in supporting and in uh, providing recommendation to the data spaces. Uh, we have a gradual implementation of this in in the first uh, couple of years, so it will start. Uh, uh, with the first call of the Digital Euro program, which we, we hope to launch uh, soon after the adoption, so in October. Uh, first of all, the creation of a network of stakeholders, and then identify common requirements for the data spaces and started to build uh, this sort of horizontal layer uh, in parallel with the creation of the data spaces. This will also be not so easy because uh, ideally we should go in a sort of uh, uh, a sequential order but uh, uh, this would take too long. So there will be uh, things which happen more or less in parallel, which is maybe not the most efficient way of implementing uh, a vision, but at the same time, this should allow to have a certain faster uh, implementation, even if sometimes maybe there will be the necessity to, 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 to fine tune uh, uh, from time to time uh, the, this parallel progress of, of, of different activities. Um, there is also a chapter of the Digital Europe program, which is particularly addressing open data, which is basically um, specifically addressing what uh, I've shown uh, and already exists uh, now. So uh, on one hand, uh, we will uh, support the continuation of the European data portal of the data.europa.eu, uh, uh, which uh, was uh, funded so far by the Connect Euro facility. That will be still funding to, to continue to, to support the, 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 the portal, which is an essential tool to find a single entry point for uh, accessing all the open data made available uh, through the uh, Open Data Directive. And then uh, another important uh, point to, uh, in a way, support the implementation of the, uh, in this case, of the uh, high value data sets. So the high value data regulation is a regulation, so there is an obligation on, on member state to, to, to do whatever is, uh, uh, is included, and in particular, uh, creating APIs, because so far, I think we think that most of the uh, data set which will be included in the high value data set regulation are already out there free of charge. So there will be not much, uh, much change in terms of uh, uh, costs necessary to make uh, available data for free, which are now uh, made available under payment. But uh, uh, many of those data are not yet available under, uh, with APIs. So that will be entail a certain cost. And even if we do are not able, and we cannot, and we don't want to just pay all these costs because this is not the objective of the regulation, but still we want to, 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 have, to, to provide some help. So uh, there will be grants uh, helping to uh, helping member states, public administration, which uh, have to make available high value data sets to, uh, for example, implement uh, APIs or uh, even better, or even also uh, take the opportunity to uh, harmonize a bit more those data sets in order to, to have them uh, uh, harmonized at a certain uh, uh, cross-border level, for example, it would be good to have uh, uh, proposals coming from more than one country, uh, addressing not only the creation of API, but also the harmonization of a certain uh, set of data sets, uh, so that uh, uh, you have a more uh, easy uh, way of uh, uh, reusing those data. Uh, this should be the end of my presentation, just to, to give an idea uh, of uh, yeah, the calendar. Huh? So the data act, so the, the second part of this legal act, which uh, we should uh, uh, adopt. Uh, we still hope to have a, a, an adoption of the proposal by the end of this year, or maybe a delay later should be beginning of next year. This will uh, uh, concern essentially B2G and B2B data sharing, so sharing between business and government and, uh, and between the, 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 the private sector. Uh, the Data Governance Act, which uh, was adopted as a proposal beginning of this year, we hope to have it adopted at the latest in 2022 and maybe even before. 
Then we have funding programs. I, I, I said, uh, I think, uh, quite a lot on, on the digital Europe, which uh, uh, will be adopted uh, in one month at the latest, and then soon after we will have the first goals. What we adopt is the World Program 2021-2022, so we should start uh, immediately after that to, to think to what to do in 2023 and so on. So it's, uh, it's the usual uh, commission cycle. But the Digital Europe program is not the only one out there. Huh? We have the uh, Connect Europe facility is not uh, 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 is still uh, existing. Uh, it's F2. Um, it's more addressing now broadband and uh, and uh, physical infrastructure, but it's still existing. Then there is of course the Horizon Europe for what is more innovation and research. And uh, uh, it's also important to remind the recovery fund. So the huge amount of money which has been. Uh, uh, now basically uh, agreed with member states. Uh, with, uh, so, so the, the plans from members from member states have, I think, all been adopted or are going to be uh, to be adopted or approved by by the Commission. And uh, that's a lot of money which has been uh, uh, which is going to be invested in uh, not only in digital, of course, but there is around twenty percent of the. Uh, recovery fund should be dedicated to digital, and that's also quite an important component, which uh, we think should complement uh, the, the, the funding coming from the other uh, programs. This was really the end of my presentation. Yeah, thank you, Daniela. That thank was you. very, yeah, very informative, very uh, excellent overview. Uh, I will, uh, I will hit uh, with the one question, and then we will uh, uh, go to the next speaker. Uh, uh, maybe a bit provocative question. Um, so when you look at, uh, for example, uh, US, uh, Brazil, uh, China, uh, uh, African Union, what is the things that you as a, a you know, policymaker or a support policymaker in at European Commission, what is the thing that you may be you know, proud of and something that you feel like you know, other continents do better? Well, let's say that what... Uh, uh... The Commission has been changing its, its, its approach, and I think it's a, it, it's a good approach now. Uh, well, we are also, of course, giving a look to what happens around us. Um, we still have to take into account that uh, uh, other countries have also a different way of uh, dealing with, uh, with policies. And uh, uh, the approach that we have in Europe uh, has more constraints trends in a way. Uh, of course, we all know the GDPR and uh, since we want to keep the European approach, which is, for example, having a huge protection uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, personal data, uh, we need to face the fact that this implies also more difficulties than uh, the similar approach that can be adopted uh, uh, in the United States or in China and so on. So uh, we need to take this into account and we have to pay the price to a certain extent. Mm. So this is why uh, uh, we, we learn the certain flexibilities that uh, third parties have. We also have a, a study which I invite you to, 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 to read, which uh, monitors uh, the uh, data economy uh, in Europe, but it also in, in third countries, and in particular in, uh, in uh, <laughs> the country that you mentioned, Brazil, China, uh, United States, and uh, well, now the UK. Uh, and there we, we can already derive some some uh, some some interesting facts. But uh, hey, please uh, share that study with us. Please share yeah, it. Uh, uh, you can okay. share it through chat, or you can. Uh, I will share the link in the chat. Uh, in the chat. And uh, but okay, so, so what I want to, to to say as a conclusion is that uh, uh, we have learned two things basically. We still want to protect to 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 defend the European values, so uh, not to give up at all on the principle like uh, protecting uh, private data, which can entail more uh, complicated uh, ways of making uh, valuable data, but we want to do that. And at the same time, we have learned that, especially in difficult times, uh, it can be a challenge to rely on uh, resources which come from third countries. And this is also something which uh, uh, we want to implement much more in, in the future, and it's also embedded in, in many activities of the Digital Europe program. Uh, developing a European uh, capacity, uh, not only for data, but also for the infrastructure. So setting up a European uh, cloud, setting up a, a high uh, performance computing is a way uh, of becoming independent, not because we want to be uh, isolated in the world, but because we want to be able to uh, rely on our own resources 
and in case of problems, uh, be able to continue and not to depend on someone which can uh, close or open uh, the, the, the availability of, of resources which are uh, crucial for us. Thank you, that's a very good point. With this thing we stop, uh, we uh, move to a, a second speaker of the day, uh, Mark Vela Muscat, he's uh, from the Hadea agency. Um, he's, uh, Mark told me he's less in the policy making, but uh, he's a, uh, he manages a project like uh, like a geo harmonizer so he's going to talk about more about the hadia in the context of uh, which public open data uh, being supported so please mark uh, the floor is yours i turn off my microphone hi tom thank you very much for the uh, the introduction um, can you see my slides and can you hear me yes, we hear you and we see your slides Excellent, thank you very much. So, uh, good morning everyone and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to address this conference this morning. And uh, I'm sorry that my schedule did not permit me to uh, be there uh, in person. And um, thanks Tom and Daniele for uh, the introductions. Um, Daniele is particularly uh, paves the way for my presentation. And um, so my name is Mark Vela Muscat, and uh, I'm a project manager in the field of telecommunications uh, at the newly formed European Health and Digital Executive Agency, which is also known as uh, HADEA. Now I say newly because until recently, the digital sector of HADEA formed part of a different agency that was known as INEA, and which has since ceased to exist. And um, as far as my project management work goes, I'm responsible for projects that fall in the sectors of public open data and cybersecurity. And I'm here today to follow up a little bit uh, from the previous presentation by Daniele, so, so as to explain a, a little bit about what my agency does and to give you some uh, examples of how public open data policy work translates into projects on the ground, such as the one funding the project connected to this conference, uh, the GeoHarmonizer project. So the agency I work for is one of six executive agencies, all based in Brussels. Uh, the agency was set up by the European Commission as of the current multi-annual financial framework to manage funding programs in the fields of health, uh, digital technologies, food safety, industry and space. And our mission is to implement projects that strengthen Europe in these domains, thus helping European society to become more healthy, resilient and fair, and for European industry to become more competitive. Overall, the expected total budget to be managed by HADEA in the new uh, MFF will amount to over 20 billion, which will be broken down as per this slide. Uh, but what we are interested in for the purpose of today's presentation in terms of digital content is the 800 million um, that is earmarked for the Digital Europe program and the 1.7 billion earmarked for the digital part of the second Connecting Europe facility. In addition to this, we will also continue to manage the legacy programs related to the areas presented in the previous slide, such as the uh, digital part of the first Connecting Europe facility program, for which we were responsible for a budget of around 600 million, and from which funding for the likes of a Geo Harmonizer is derived. 410 projects are currently being implemented and 310 have already been closed. So whilst the program is closed now from the planning perspective, meaning that there'll be no new calls under CEF-1, we're about halfway through the program in terms of implementation. So new calls will be available under the, the Connecting Europe Facility 2 and the DEP program that Daniele mentioned in his presentation. Now, in terms of uh, objectives, the main aim of the telecoms part of the Connecting Europe facility was to facilitate cross-border interaction between public administrations, businesses, and citizens from different European countries, in which very different standards or national systems may have been deployed. Now, in order to facilitate a cross-border interaction, Supported projects under the Connecting Europe facility, uh, facility Telecom were required to contribute to the creation of a European ecosystem of interoperable and interconnected digital services. As a simple example, 
uh, consider the movement of health data across national borders in order to ensure uh, the continuity of care and safety of citizens seeking health care outside of their home country. Um, the CEF Telecom uh, is funding um, projects under the eHealth digital service infrastructure. Uh, and this will therefore facilitate uh, exchanges of health data and the provision of cross-border e-prescription and patient summary services. Now there's several DSIs in a variety of sectors, but all follow the same structure. They're made up of a core service platform, which acts as a bridge between different national solutions and systems, and then by generic services shown here on the, on the left, that help national systems to connect to and interact with the core service platform. So the GeoHarmonizer project, as an example, is participating in the development of uh, generic services in the field of public open data. So there's 15 different um, DSIs. Uh, DSIs is what I is the acronym I use for digital service infrastructures. Um, there's 15 currently being managed uh, under the CEF Telecom which cover a wide range of different sectors in areas such as justice, uh, cybersecurity, uh, health, cultural heritage, and of course, uh, public open data, which has received uh, 4.2 million euros so far over 35 projects. So turning now to public open data uh, more specifically, which is the DSI connected to today's conference, uh, as mentioned before, all DSIs are made up of core service platforms and by generic services. And public data is, is no, um, no different. In this case, the core service platform is the uh, European data portal, uh, which acts as a one-stop shop to provide harmonized access to data sets created and managed by public bodies in the member states. With regards to the generic services, all projects funded under this, uh, this DSI contribute to the availability of harmonized content at the EU level and to its cross-border and cross-domain reuse. In other words, our projects under uh, public open data generate data sets covering very diverse areas such as biodiversity, uh, air quality data, geospatial data, and they generate services addressing um, several public policy areas of key importance, such as uh, forest fires control, smart farming, mobility and air pollution monitoring, <clears throat> or even the, digital, the digitalization of cultural resources. Another interesting point to note about public open data is that uh, some technologies being employed by public open data projects are currently trending topics, such as the linked open data paradigm, uh, high performance computing, big data analytics, and artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms. So out of the 35 projects receiving funding, seven of them have already been finalized and the generated data sets have been uploaded uh, to the European data portal, covering the areas shown um, in the slide, which include uh, the environment, geospatial data, meteorological data, research and innovation, uh, transport, science and technology, and government and the public sector. With the current ongoing projects, uh, however, we expect this number to grow both on areas covered as well as the number of, of data sets available. Now, to give you some more concrete examples of some of our projects, I've enlisted the help of some of our project coordinators who've kindly helped me in preparing the following part of my presentation. So, <clears throat> so the first project I would like to present is called the Trefer Project which brings together 10 partners from Italy and Spain to develop innovative and sustainable services, combining air quality, weather conditions, and traffic flows. So the motivation behind the project lies in the concern that European nations have about air quality, which is estimated to cause around 400,000 deaths a year in Europe. Since the main source of air pollution includes road traffic, domestic heating and industrial combustion, uh, combustion, the project focuses on the impact of traffic on urban air quality. In this respect, the project aims to provide citizens and decision makers with tools to rapidly understand, forecast, and improve the air quality conditions at the urban level. So far, it's been implemented in six EU cities of varying sizes, 
which shows uh, the flexibility and replicability uh, of the program. Uh, the cities are uh, Zaragoza, Firenze, uh, Modena, uh, Livorno, Santiago de Compostela, and Pisa. So from, uh, from its outset, the project aimed at estimating the level of pollution on an urban scale to achieve four main results, uh, which include uh, the definition of a standard set of metadata, uh, which would be able to be represented in urban air quality maps, the provision of uh, real-time estimations of air pollution in the participating uh, cities uh, on an urban scale, and in order to provide such a service, a set of low cost air quality sensors have been deployed and their measurements have been combined with measurements by official uh, city regulatory uh, air quality stations in order to build uh, informative maps of the different levels uh, of pollution in the urban areas. Um, another uh, achievement uh, was the development of a service for uh, predictions of, air, uh, of urban air quality based on weather forecast and, uh, and traffic flows. And this service makes use of uh, high performance computing technologies in order to compute the uh, estimation of the diffusion of pollutants in the urban area. And uh, lastly, the project sought to publish open data sets uh, describing urban air quality maps, prediction maps and traffic flows in the six uh, EU cities covered by the project. And in this respect, um, more than 800 data sets have been published on local open data portals and more than uh, 500 appear on the European data portal. Moreover, the project has developed a set of mobile apps, web apps and map visualization tools for providing citizens and public administrations with real time information on the estimated levels of pollution in the urban areas and allowing them to explore air pollution forecasts and analyze new scenarios. Uh, these apps have a strong potential to improve the quality of life of these urban areas uh, by helping policymakers identify trends, uh, seasonal events, abnormal behaviors, and detecting possible hotspots. They also make um, citizens aware of the strong impact uh, that traffic has on, on air quality. So uh, two main methodologies have been used in the project, uh, one for air quality monitoring and one for air quality forecasting. Um, for air quality monitoring, um, a new urban air quality sensor network has been installed in uh, Santiago de Compostela, Zaragoza and Modena. And uh, the air quality sensor network networks in uh, Pisa, Firenze and Livorno have been enriched with, with new sensors. Um, a total amount of 162 new low cost air quality sensors uh, for monitoring um, nitric acid, nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide and ozone have been integrated thanks to this project. Um, next, given that um, low cost sensors require a constant monitoring and a precise calibration to provide uh, air pollutant uh, concentrations, Different calibration strategies based on, uh, on AI techniques were compared and tested during the project in all cities. Uh, then after a collocation period where sensors were placed near uh, the official uh, air quality stations in the cities to be trained, they were then moved to different locations in the urban areas to measure the air quality uh, at local conditions. And then finally, based on the measurements uh, provided, the low cost sensors, uh, so the, the, the uh, measurements provided, based on the measurements provided by the, uh, the low cost sensors and using in, interpolation techniques, the project was able to release um, real time urban air quality maps for the six cities roughly every uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, now in terms of the air quality forecasting method, uh, simulation models have been used based on weather conditions and uh, traffic emissions. So to emulate urban traffic flows, uh, a traffic model has been employed based on real-time data uh, collected by traffic sensors. 
Essentially, the traffic model creates a, a digital twin of the road network and traffic flows of the city in semi real time. Then given historical traffic flows uh, in each road of the city and the urban vehicle fleet, it was possible to automatically compute the total nitrogen oxide emissions for each road of the network. After this, uh, an open source simulation software was employed to simulate how emitted particles move in the air, considering uh, winds, weather conditions, and the shape of the buildings in the urban area. Um, the model also took into account the nitrogen oxide emissions generated by traffic flows and also other emission sources, such as uh, house heating, waste management, uh, energy consumption, et cetera. And it was then uh, able to produce a dispersion map that shows uh, nitrogen oxide concentration values on an urban grid of two to four meters for every hour for the uh, following 48 hours. So that was the uh, Trafair project and the uh, Trafair.eu website contains all information uh, about the project and dissemination uh, activities carried out. And moreover, a Twitter account and a YouTube channel provides uh, multiple uh, multimedia materials. And in case of specific questions, don't hesitate to contact either myself or the project uh, coordinator. Um, this brings me to the second project that I'd like to present to you today, which is called the uh, Grapevine Project, which is a project that aims at providing uh, open information to farmers potentially affected by uh, diseases that affect um, grape yards so that they can apply more effective uh, treatments. The project brings together uh, seven partners from Spain and Greece and through the use of existing open data, uh, high performance computing and data infrastructures, the project's creating predictive models based on deep learning techniques to improve the prevention and control of mildew and other grapevine diseases in the wine cultivation sector. So um, a bit of motivation behind the project. Uh, according to Eurostat, grapevines were grown in EU on 3.2 million hectares of land in 2015, with 2.4 million wine grower holdings and representing about 45% of the world's total area where, uh, where grapevines are grown. However, grapevines can be affected by many kinds of uh, pests and diseases, which can be devastating on the crops. So the need thus arose for the development of a proper protection method against these pests together with um, sustainable production systems. So the idea is that um, better monitoring and early reaction against um, highly destructive diseases will enable a decreasing in the amount of, uh, of fungicide and the number of protective treatments. So uh, in view of this, uh, the project proposes a predictive uh, model uh, based on a series of different agroclimatic and biological variables to assess risk uh, and predicting the evolution of pests and providing knowledge to decision makers. Uh, the hope is that the results will enable farmers to focus the treatments at the appropriate moments so as to reduce the uh, expansion of pathogens. So in order to fulfill its goal, um, data is collected from several different sources including um, on site through the uh, phytosanitary surveillance network of Aragon, uh, through sensors for capturing spores and insects, uh, through the project partner's own meteorological stations, uh, through open, open data sources, such as um, satellite imaging uh, from uh, Copernicus, um, hyperspectral and multispectral image capturing and uh, weather forecasts. So all this data then feeds into the high performance computing system through a data manager and data is processed uh, through the different models to provide uh, the outputs for the forecasts. Uh, the resulting output is a map with the risk level for the different uh, pests per cultivation plot. So the farmers can apply the corresponding uh, phytosanitary um, products or pesticides only in the areas uh, at risk. In terms of benefits and impact, uh, the project contributes to sustainable agriculture by promoting um, environmentally friendly methods of farming, such as less widespread use of pesticides, 
uh, by improving food safety and consumer protection and by increasing uh, profitability through the optimization of costs. At the same time, the development uh, by the project of replicable and adaptable IT services in the sector opens the door for the use of open data and other data infrastructure technologies uh, to be applied to other fruit and vegetable crops um, in the agricultural sector. And it also provides an opportunity for other regions in Europe facing similar issues to replicate the services. Like in the uh, previous example, uh, the project website, uh, grapevine-project.eu, contains all information about the project and the dissemination activities carried out. Um, there's also a Twitter account and a YouTube channel where you can get more uh, multimedia materials. And in case of specific questions, do not hesitate uh, to contact me or the, the project coordinator. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. It's been a privilege for me to join you today and I look forward to receiving any questions you may have at the uh, time specified uh, by Tom. Uh, and thanks uh, again to the organizers for the invitation to speak today. And uh, I wish you continued success in the continuation of your conference and uh, in the continuation of your project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yes. Uh, you cannot see you cannot see the people, but there's about uh, I think uh, uh, close to 40 people uh, in the conference center, and there's also about uh, it's 27 online. Uh, so uh, we have a time for one question. Any questions? Maybe I will uh, hit in the question. Uh, um, how does the Hadea? Uh, so uh, how do you, what do you do with the projects after they finish? Do you have something like, um, so after the, the projects finish, do you still track projects or, um, you know, do, do you keep track like universities keep track of students through alumni network or something? Do you have something like that? Yeah, we continue to monitor them beyond the end um, for, for a short while, not, not uh, forever. Uh, but the hope is that, uh, you know, so it all begins with the policy, as Daniela uh, explained. Then it comes to us for the implementation, and the hope is that the results are then used by the policymakers uh, again. And I often get questions from different commission uh, services uh, asking about the results of projects long after they've closed. So, so yes, but this isn't an, uh, an eternal uh, monitoring. Okay, uh, with this thing, we, uh, because of the time, we have to go to the next uh, speaker. So thank you, Mark, one more time. And please stay, follow the lectures. There's lots of interesting lectures. Uh, and also please join the discussion panels. I think you will be interested to hear all the discussion. So we go to the next speaker. Uh, this is Kodrina Ili. Uh, she will do actually two talks. So that's very practical. We need about one minute just to switch the laptops. Uh, so please be with us.
Okay. So, okay, welcome to the conference. Uh, I am Kodrina Ilie, part of. Oh. Wow. This is the first time that I present in a hybrid event, but I'm present. So, of uh, Terrasigna, which is part of the consortium working for the. Uh, uh, for the geo harmonizer. So today I'm going to present an initiative that uh, me and some of my colleagues and even outside of the company we've been part of. Um, and uh, with the uh, right, right fancy ta uh, title. So an interactive learning of the free and open source geospatial ecosystem. What? <laughs> now, it's a really fancy type. We are mostly users of, of open source. We are developers of open source. We basically know open source, right? It's true that we have to read the license. Sometimes they don't mix. Uh, but the software itself, we do basically know it, right? So um, that was my feeling when um, some years ago in 2016, as part of a working group within a yes? screen share. Screen share. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> uh, screen share, screen share. The green button. Okay. Find your presentation. This one here. Yeah. Yeah. Working group. Um, and the idea of the working group was to identify that whether for the companies within this association, an open source initiative would make sense. And these were the partners within the, within the working group. So uh, among other things, uh, during, that, uh, during that work, uh, I had to show the level of maturity or to, to try to explain how this free and open source uh, uh, solutions for geospatial work, uh, world looks like. Uh, and I imagine that this task would not be that difficult, you know, and the question would be why would such a question even arise in a uh, European private sector. Well, there's really no doubt anymore with data that we collect through different sensors, that we calculate, we extract through models, we get through models, uh, we get through satellites, so on and so forth. And that this amount of data is um, incentivizing the development of various and many, many uh, open source, uh, many projects, many um, um, solutions, if you'd like. And um, it's no secret that for the geospatial section, a uh, critical part of them are open source. And I'm sure that now in your mind, GDAL appears. Um, so this was the reason why uh, this question would pop up in a European association. So um, the questions open source, so we can use the modified change and so on. Why is there any need of understanding how they uh, function and together? And do they even function together? So why do we need to understand it? And why can't we just use it? 
The answer to that is that by understanding how they interrelate, because they, as you'll see later, they have a lot of deep intrinsic connections, um, we can truly understand the solutions that we use and we can truly harvest their, their power. So um, when started to work, starting to work uh, to uh, map this uh, open source for geospatial, I have found out that this was not the first attempt. In 2005, 6 and 7, Paul Ramsey uh, did a similar, a similar, uh, had a similar initiative. Uh, it was like a report, a reporting initiative, the state of open source GIS. And what he did was to uh, separate uh, the so-called uh, independent development tribes and he defined this these tribes the C You have to it's no problem. Uh, I, it's, it's okay. Okay. 
sorry. Uh, so as, as I was mentioning, the community is growing and it's growing in different directions. And one of them uh, is represented by these memorandum of understandings that OSGEO is signing with different, with different organizations. But Angelus will tell you more about this. Another way that the community is growing is exactly things like the ones that we attend now through all the events, dedicated or related events to Phosphor G. Here we just have some, uh, we have the, just the global Phosphor G conference, which is the flagship event of OSGEO. And um, we, we invite you at Phosphor G 2021, uh, who's also going to be online. And you've actually met one of the organizers for the, for the people that have attended the grass, um, the grass uh, workshops. Uh, Vera Andrea, uh, Andrea is one of the is one of the organizers. But moving forward, we can see that there is a growth in the number of people interested in these uh, in these conferences. So user developers and so on. Another another uh, way in which the uh, open source for geospatial community, if you'd like, develops is through the more active events like the code sprints, the hackathons, and with some variations, mapathons. We do know that these events are events where coders get together to with you know with a with a big list of bugs to solve and uh, tickets to close and new releases uh, uh, to to prepare and of course um, they're also known to enjoy pizza and juice while they're doing it uh, this is from 2016 from phosphor g um, but if you think that these code springs and this uh, open source community is just an activity that is you know, on your own time, uh, on, on, on your own time passion, uh, passion projects, well, think again, because in the last, let's say, seven to eight years, bigger institutions have started to take a closer and more attentive look to the open source paradigm and the way that it develops. And one good example is ESA, which in 2015 organized its very first uh, code sprint for the uh, for the release of Snap Toolbox. So I, I imagine that you at least know about Snap or used it many times until now. So that was developed with uh, through um, through these through these kind of uh, events and. This hackathon in 2015 uh, became a, a precedent because it continued in 2016. Since 2017, they're also making posters, and you can check these events online, um, the results online to see to see what uh, what came uh, out of them. And in 2020, they are already. Uh, rebranding the hackathon, the code sprint with the EO dashboard hackathon. So the, the idea that I'm trying to highlight is that the open source um, model and the open source community for geospatial has uh, a quite well-defined uh, maturity at, uh, at this point. And it's not only ESA. Another uh, very good example is uh, is of course NASA, and you can see down that um, on their open source projects, they have about 500. They have 573 uh, solutions um, uh, listed. So the 2005 tribes doesn't really apply anymore because today, well, there are a lot of them. <laughs> so. Going back to my task in 2016, somehow I had to give an overview to what the open source for geospatial um, means. So it was not a, wasn't that easy task as I first imagined, but we had to start from somewhere in understanding this, this uh, and understanding and also sharing with people that are outside of community what, what this means. So uh, we took some steps. We first decided that maybe we should categorize these solutions. And we have decided on main four categories. Um, one was related to the programming languages, the second to license the organization, meaning the maintaining organization of that solution. 
uh, and of course the the category of it and at that point we defined uh, five categories the desktop core libraries mobile server side and the weirdo <laughs> web tools um, and this is what we got um, I'd like to mention that although this started in 2000 and um, and, and 16, we are still trying to update it. This is a very um, light representation, a graph did with uh, D3 uh, GI, uh, GS, uh, trying to show the connection between each of these solutions. And if you go to different core libraries, you see how they're connected to other libraries. And here, for example, you can also search, okay, you know, so for example, that Tom mentioned, and you can go to you can go to the website but anyway this is just a, a nice hopefully visualization of what we did the information behind is much more uh, i think it's much more useful um and going back these are just like very uh, basic statistics uh, trying to show what uh, what we've uh, what we've collected uh, we can see that the web tools are becoming more and more uh, prevalent uh, and another thing that i'd like to draw your attention is the fact that most of the open source solutions are community based and going further, the most common, the most uh, common licenses and uh, the most uh, popular programming languages um, are listed in these uh, in these graphs that I will not uh, insist on. But the thing is that, <laughs> but the thing is that looking at the information that we've gathered, in order for it to be truly useful and not only pretty to look at, we understood that we needed another category, a fifth category, uh, and that is standard compliance or conformity or which standards are implemented by which solutions in order to understand the in, in a more deep way than the way that these components function together and can be put to work together. So in that respect, we started a collaborate, we started a work collaboration, let's say, with OGC, trying to understand and try to uh, draft this guideline on how to uh, take the information related to standard compliance and uh, add it to our graph. And uh, the discussion with uh, OGC was very interesting because once you start talking about standards, you understand how complicated it can truly, it can truly be. So you have a solution that can read GML data. Okay, but what kind of GML, what version? Is it two, is it three? Uh, what, uh, is it uh, just simple features maybe? Or what profile? Uh, and what about interoperability between standards? Because OGC indeed is a very important uh, organization, but it's not the only one. So how does it interact with, for example, Inspire or with other standards from ISO? So the discussion became very, uh, <laughs> very um, intense and uh, we are working into developing this um, this fifth category uh, so um, important to mention though is that everything uh, you know the the ecosystem and the way that they're connected goes beyond at least for the open source goes beyond the software itself and that brought me to the questions that Paul Ramsey asked himself in 2005 in his first report on the open source uh, GIS status. So there are some questions showing the health of the, uh, if you'd like, the health of the project itself, uh, the solution itself. So is it well documented? Is the development team transparent? Is the, uh, how wide is the development community and how wide is the user community? So these questions are, um, we are still thinking about a way to uh, to uh, harvest the information uh, for for the solutions in this in this direction. However, 
we do have a dream because, as I mentioned, um, this initiative, we want to de develop it more into a, more than just a pretty graph that we can look at. And the idea is for someone that is completely outside of the open source um, community, let's say, that can have a tool in which to interrogate and to find out if uh, the work that he or she does can be done with an open source solution and how that solution integrates with other solutions that they have. Is it interoperable? Do they read the same data? Um, uh, what is the license? What is the main organization that is um, that is taking care of maintaining the solution and um, and so on. So this is the uh, this is the the aim towards which we are which we are going and of course we are also uh, working and trying to draft um, an open an open platform in which the community can insert their own uh, their own uh, you know, their own solutions so um, that was it <laughs> thank you very much and sorry for all the technical issues <laughs> Uh, a bit late, but uh, we have time for a question. Oh. No, then we can uh, go to the next uh, talk, and uh, we will be a bit uh, later with the coffee. I will go super fast with this one uh, because it's not a talk in itself, but it's an invitation that we're making uh, to you. Tom mentioned it at the, the beginning of the. Um, uh, of the conference uh, on Friday, we are going to have a discussion panel, and this is just like a small incentive of what we want to do. So, the title uh, it, it it was meant to be uh, to be motivated, and you've heard a lot about open data in the first two discussions, and you know the geoharmonizer information is an open data. So, um, the idea is how we make that sustainable. Um, this is the context. This is the context of our project, and I'm sure that many of you have been part of the project of project that uh, had to provide open data, but there was no subsequent um, way of keeping that uh, of updating the that uh, that data. Um, I will skip this really fast. For example, in the case of GeoHarmonizer, uh, through the uh, consortium agreement, OpenGeoHub made the statement that they would keep the portal uh, viable for another five years and they, they would update the data set, so on and so forth. However, this is not a standard. And uh, however, we don't know if other companies and other projects would do the same and if this is truly sustainable. So. Um, and the bigger context that we are go that in which our discussion takes place is that the open data is just one small building block out of a lot of uh, a lot of other elements that define the open paradigm. We've heard about open source. We've heard about open standards, open context, open access, open methods, open research, and so on and so forth. So this is just to give you a very short and hopefully motivating incentive to participate with us on Friday, uh, where we will have a little bit more detail on the topic and we'll also share some questions with you and to see uh, what do you think of this, uh, of this sustainability of open data with respect uh, of the private sector. So thank you. Okay, so we have for the Friday, uh, so Friday announcement for the discussion panel. So please, if you have idea or some document uh, that you would like to um, uh, add to the discussion, please uh, forward to Katrina. Um, otherwise, we are we are now close, we are uh, finished with this session. Are there any questions for Katrina about this or the previous talk? It was very clear. <laughs> uh, maybe, uh, maybe one question, like, uh, like who are the like, best examples for you of success in, uh, let's say, in open source? Uh, so the important sense that you feel like 
uh, you know, a kind of win-win system. So open source wins and the business wins. Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, the first element that usually indicates to me that the the solution is successful is when I post a question on a forum or on IRC or whatever, and I get an answer to my problem. Usually, that shows the strong viability of the of the solution. Related to um, win-win situation of open source and uh, from a private perspective. Um, in the end, and there are a lot of papers on the topic and a lot of presentation, open source is a business model as just a different one from the um, classical one, let's say. And um, instead of paying for a license, you pay for the programmers that can solve your solution based on a commodity that exists, which is the open source solution itself. So. Um, so, so, like one of the biggest open source, I mean, the biggest open source, like Android, right? Um, but you, many people actually don't think it's open source. They, they, they recognize a, a business. Yeah. So, so, like at some stage, it can happen that it's unnatural um, that you know people just reckon something professional, reliable, um, and you know people chose Android mm -hmm. versus a Microsoft phone and. And, uh, Apple and so, uh, so, so that's for example for me example where um, open source became so professional and, and accepted by people that they don't even you know they don't even consider it's a problem of open source. It's and, a commodity. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Elise. Uh, we'll thank stop you. And, uh, let's have a coffee break for people that are online. Uh, stay on this uh, uh, Zoom. <laughs> Uh, please stay on the connected to the Zoom. Uh, we will just uh, go out for coffee and we'll come back and we'll start exactly at uh, 10.55. We have the first speaker, Ingo Simonis, then uh, Hannes Reuter from the Eurostat, uh, Pablo Perez Chavez uh, from the Finoc, uh, and Maria Antonia Provelli from the Polytechnical de Milan. So please see you.
Ingo? Yes, please. Hannes Roller speaking here from your start. Wouldn't you mind, I, I haven't um, tested the screen sharing. I would like to do that. Can I have the screen for two seconds, please? Sure, I stopped. It's all yours. Okay, thank you. Let me just see and do the screen share from uh, this one here. Okay, I need to move the chat. Do you see anything? We, yeah, we see a title slide. 